really plan to uh, do sustainability. That was never uh, really my thing. I was uh, I was a competitive gymnast for a long time, and that was kind of my thing. So I was kind of into PNT PT after that. Kind of it all made sense uh, in my head. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm guessing none of you are paying attention to me. That's okay. That was the point. Um, this is a lot more interesting, isn't it? it it's pretty uh, important stuff. And I'm guessing a lot of you are fairly educated on climate change and on what's happening right now. Um, that'll be done in a second. <laughs> but yeah, let's reset a little. I was not planning to study sustainability. That was not something that was ever really in my wheelhouse. I was planning to maybe go to medical school or do physical therapy. And I realized that that wasn't something I actually wanted to do um, kind of right around the same time that I met my girlfriend. Um, and up until that point, I'd never really thought about long term. That was never really something that was in my uh, vocabulary. It was I was just trying to get to the end of the week, get through assignments, get through practice, and just move on with my life. Um, and so at all at the same time, my current plans started to fall apart right in front of me, and I started for the first time to think about what will life be like when we get married or when we have kids 20, 30 years from now? What is this going to be like? What's the future going to look like uh, in that time? And so I started to really think about that a little bit hard. And um, the thing that really opened my eyes to the real possibility of the world being different at that point is this, this graph. And it's pretty simple, um, but you can see things go right, everything goes good, we stay in one to two degrees uh, of uh, global temperature raise. And if everything goes wrong, we wind up at five degrees or, or maybe even more. Um, and the stuff on the right seems bad, and the stuff on the left seems much worse. Um, so I, along with a lot of other people, started searching climate anxiety in Google. Uh, that search trend is up about 500% over the last five years. It is a massively uh, growing thing. Not just me, it's not just you out in the audience, but it's big. So what is it? Climate change, that's pretty obvious. You can see it right behind me. Anxiety is just a generalized fear of something that has yet to happen. So climate anxiety, simply put, is a generalized fear about climate change. Um, and so why is that important? Why does it matter? Well, the thing is, when you have climate anxiety, typically people go one of two ways. On the one hand, you can freeze and you do nothing. And that's not really that helpful because you, uh, well, you don't do anything. On the other hand, you can really overcorrect. And that's kind of what I did when I first realized that I was having climate anxiety. I decided oh, I should make all these sustainable switches, you know, uh, stop using paper towels and buy this instead, or uh, i got to make sure I don't eat any meat, uh, you know, even if I go out for dinner, if I'm, you know, on a late drive home and I can't stop for a hamburger, I can't do that. Um, so these are the two schools of thought, right? And one of them is uh, not helpful, and the other one is not helpful to yourself because now you're setting yourself up for failure by burning out on your own climate anxiety. So... That sounds bad for me, but it's bad for everyone else, too. In 2015, a study was done, and only about 15% of people had climate anxiety. Three years later, that number doubled to almost 30%. And as of this year, about two-thirds of people suffer to some extent from climate anxiety. So it's important for all of us, and probably because this data, even if you don't actively suffer from it now, you probably will in the coming years uh, as things get worse and worse. And as you saw with that Instagram scroll through, we're getting bombarded with this imagery all the time. Whether it's on social media or in mass media, it plays really well to have this really negative narrative about climate change. Because it's true. Things are really bad and they are really scary. But we see this imaging all the time, and it keeps you in so-called filter bubble as soon as you start to like or share something that's about climate change because you find it important, you see it more and more often. And this is a little bit scary. It can really send people down kind of a rabbit hole about climate change and climate anxiety. So how do we tackle climate anxiety? Well, it's the same way we tackle climate change, something that's called the 80-20 principle. The idea is that you put in 80% of the effort to make 20% of the change, and you put in 20% of the effort to make 80% of the change. Basically, you need to put a little amount of effort into something where it really, really makes sense. So a way that this plays out in the real world is that only about 20% of our water and electric use is actually residential in Europe. The rest of it goes to non-residential uses. 
So if you're at home and you take a really short shower or you keep your temperature really low even in the winter, I know you guys are probably now turning up your thermostat or maybe choosing not to. Uh, if you're doing that because you're scared of the climate, it, that's really great. You are making a real change and that's, that's great. However, a much bigger change could be made if you did the same thing at your office because that's where most of this energy and most of this water is going. If you can choose, if you have the ability to choose to uh, eat plants which are made with less water, that's helping the water strain on our crops in Europe. Whereas if you take a shorter shower, yes, you're making a bit of a difference, but it's small compared to these larger systems at play. So usually people with climate anxiety who are active about it want to make some substantial changes. And for me, that came in the, in the form of going into sustainability as a career. Um, and that for me, I went from having all these little changes like trying to not eat so much uh, meat and not trying to buy unsustainable products, so on, so called. Um, and instead I said, well, you know what would be better is if I just actually really dedicated what I can do to making a difference in this, in this fight. Um, and that was important for me. And so one takeaway you can take from this is that instead of making a bunch of minute changes that really interfere with your way of living, try to make one or two really substantial changes where maybe it's a long-term thing that you're investing in an electric car because that makes sense for you, or a nice e-bike, or just a nice bike that you can ride every day to work. Or maybe you are thinking about changing your diet anyways, and maybe you want to switch away from eating as much meat. That makes sense for you. But don't try to fit it into every single aspect of your life because that's the way that you burn out on this very quickly. Oh. <laughs> the other thing is to see where you're getting your information about climate change from. If you're getting it all from social media and mass media, which is pushing you on this negative narrative, that's pretty scary. And another way this can be exploited is through something called greenwashing. Greenwashing is the idea that you can buy a product that's somehow less uh, bad for the planet, environmentally friendly, good for the dolphins, something like that. Um, and although this is really good, um, and a lot of the time does come from a place of sincere wanting to help, it can actually backfire a little bit because companies can exploit your need to help the world into them making more profits without any actually making a substantial change to their own uh, infrastructure. So something might be able to be marketed as toxin free and they paint it green and they change the label and they slap a sticker on it and all of a sudden you feel really good about buying it, but it doesn't actually change what they're doing. And so it takes a little bit more time and perspective to realize that, oh, maybe it doesn't make sense for me to make this quote unquote sustainable switch, when in reality there's a different thing that I can be doing that would be better. So it's hard to think about that and it does take some more time out of your day, but think critically about where you're getting, uh, where someone can exploit you and profit off of your climate anxiety. And one more thing you can do is to look out for good news because it is out there. Um, there's a lot of research being done, especially on the R&D level, at the low level in fundamental sciences, but there is also real substantial business work being done, real actual people out in the world making a difference in terms of climate change. There are news sources who compile ar archives of these things, publish only good news about climate, and those things are nice. When you see a bad uh, article, maybe it's nice to go and balance that out again. Although it's a little bit scary, to be continuously bombarded, you can always find the, the counterbalance to that, which can kind of help to soothe you and to keep you on the right path. So in the end, what can you do? You can do what you can do. You can't do more than that. Don't stretch yourself too thin and don't feel like the entire weight of the world is on your shoulders to help defeat climate change. Look out for people that are making good changes. Try to steer away from people who are trying to exploit you. And at the end of the day, do as much as you can in your own life. Thank you.